That's great. Good morning. Hearing on how much is too much examining the duplicative IT investments at uh, DOD, DOE, and honestly to get a chance to look at what the process that we can do in um, IT investments uh, government wide will come to order. Oversight uh, Committee existed. To, let me start all over. Good morning. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent. Second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers do have the right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of Oversight and Government Reform. I'm going to allow my opening statement to go in for the record instead of doing it orally, and I've asked the ranking member to also do the same. Is that okay with you? It is, and it's uh, one of the first in Congress, I think, Mr. Chairman. Well, you yes. know what? We can, we well, can slide that in. Listen to them instead of ourselves. That would be great uh, for this as far as the help on that. So other members will have seven days to submit their opening statements. There may be some others that will slip in on this and add the extraneous material for the record itself. I would like to welcome our panel. Let me tell you why we are rushing through the beginning of this. Uh, votes have been called somewhere between 10 to 10.15. It is our goal to try to get in the statements of our witnesses and do additional questions with them. If uh, we can keep close on time, we can get a chance to honor time and not have to break for votes and then come back. We can try to conclude before we head for votes, which will honor everyone else's time. If we are not able to do that, we will have a nice 30 to 40 minute break in the middle of our uh, hearing, and then we will come back and conclude at the end. So I would like to welcome this first panel of witnesses, uh, Mr. David uh, Pounders, the Director of Government Accountability Office's Information Technology Management Issues Team, uh, Ms. Terry uh, Takei, Takai. Sorry, I said it wrong the, uh, the first time, uh, is the Chief Information Officer at the Department of Defense. Uh, Mr. Michael Locatus is the Chief Information Officer at the Department of Energy. Mr. Richard Spires is the Chief Information Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you all for being here. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses are sworn in before they testify. If you please uh, stand and raise your right hands, please. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all witnesses have answered in the affirmative. In order to allow time for discussion, I would ask you to limit your testimony to five minutes. Of course, your entire written statement will be made part of the permanent record as well. Uh, with that, I would like to recognize Mr. Pounder for his opening statement for five minutes. Chairman Langford, Langford Ranking Member Connolly, it is a pleasure to be here this morning to discuss our latest report that highlights duplicative IT investments. The Federal Government spends nearly $80 billion on IT and it is imperative that these investments enable the government to better serve the American people. The past several years has resulted in major improvements in transparency and focus on IT management. First, in June 2009, the IT dashboard has been providing uh, cost and schedule information on nearly 800 IT investments and has provided a level of transparency and CIO accountability that is unparalleled. Today, over 250 investments totaling nearly $18 billion are at risk meaning that agencies are rating these investments in either a yellow or red status. Focusing on these at-risk investments has made a difference. OMB claims that they have saved nearly $3 billion through its tech stack reviews that have resulted in poorly performing projects being halted or canceled. However, we still have too many investments at risk. In addition to the dashboard, in December 2010, the IT reform plan uh, was, was initiated that lays out an excellent roadmap to strengthen IT acquisition, governance, and program management. It also, if implemented successfully, will result in more cost-effective IT operations by focusing on commodity IT, cloud-based solutions, and data center consolidation. Over 200 data centers have already been closed, and the goal is to close 1,000 by 2015. OMB estimates that data center consolidation will result in another $3 billion in savings. The reform plan emphasizes IT governance. Reforming and strengthening IT investment review boards and executive level governance can greatly help turn around underperforming projects, as our many reviews for the Congress have highlighted. These governance process, processes can also identify and eliminate duplicative spending. This is important because last fall we issued a report that highlighted hundreds of investments providing similar functions across the Federal Government. The numbers here are staggering. For example, last year alone the Federal Government invested in 781 supply chain systems totaling $3.3 billion, 661 human resource systems 
totaling $2.5 billion, and 580 financial management systems totaling $2.7 billion. We recommended that the Federal agencies ensure that their IT investments are not duplicative as part of their annual budget submissions. Mr. Chairman, at the Committee's request, we followed up this review with a deeper look into IT investments at the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, and Energy. Specifically, we looked at over 800 investments at these three agencies associated with human resources, IT, and supply chain management. We found 37 investments in 12 categories that are potentially duplicative. For example, we found that the Air Force had five similar contract management systems, the Navy had four similar personnel assignment systems, and Energy had three similar back-end infrastructure investments. Addressing this duplication is important since DOD and Energy have spent $1.2 billion on these 37 investments over the past five years. Our report highlights the details of these investments and makes recommendations to eliminate duplicative spending and to further report on efforts to root out duplication. The good news, Mr. Chairman, is that each agency has actions underway to tackle this duplication. DHS is furthest along, having already identified and eliminated duplicative investments through various portfolio reviews. For example, DHS consolidated six personnel security-related systems into an enterprise system. At DOD, the Navy has implemented an Executive Oversight Board chaired by the Navy CIO, and all IT expenditures greater than $100,000 are reviewed and approved by the Navy CIO to ensure that they are not duplicative. DOE has various working groups addressing the records management and back-end infrastructure areas we pointed out, and on a broader scale is holding tech stat sessions that are aimed at troubled investments and consolidating commodity IT services. Mr. Chairman, I would like to commend the leadership of the individuals on this panel. We expect further results from each agency in the near future as their efforts get more traction. But to be clear, we need more tangible results that eliminate duplicative spending. In summary, Mr. Chairman, it is safe to say that there is much more IT duplication out there. It is important that ag the agencies represented here and others use their investment governance processes to identify and address duplicative spending so that billions of taxpayers' dollars are not wasted. This concludes my statement. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Penner. Mr. Kai. Good morning, Chairman Langford and Ranking Member Connolly. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify this morning on the findings of the GAO report that Mr. Pounder just spoke of. Uh, the GAO report highlights 31 business-related DOD IT investments that cover a range of areas. Um, and as mentioned, it specifically examined contract personnel management and logistics systems. The Department is taking action to address 27 of the investments reviewed by GAO. Uh, the Department uh, has looked at the remaining four systems, um, and we are uh, prepared to, to discuss why those particular areas are actually not duplicative but more complementary. Uh, and we can go into more detail um, as you desire. The Defense Department's IT budget pre presents a unique challenge, uh, not only in terms of its magnitude, it constitutes one half of the Federal Government's overall IT expenditure, but in scope and complexity as well, as you know. Uh, the Department's FY13 budget request of approximately $37 billion includes funding all the way from desktop computers, tactical radios, human resource systems, com commercial satellite communications, financial management, and you name it. Um, these investments support mission-critical operations both in our Pentagon and office environments um, and on the battlefield. Our uh, IT environment is even more complex when one considers that we operate in 6,000 locations around the world. In this complex environment, uh, the Department's business IT systems are essential enablers of a much broader set of integrated business operations. Um, for example, paying our service members on time is a responsibility shared among various members in our organization, uh, includes both human resources and financial professionals. So the business systems challenges for us uh, really require a reform not only of our technologies, but of our processes and our government, governance and our policies. In my written statement, I have described for you the well-defined IT investment governance process that the Department uses. The Defense Business Systems Management Committee um, and our investment review boards, uh, as well as our acquisition process, are major touch points for us to ensure that we are examining our IT investments. Um, we have 
use those processes to examine our new investments, but starting in FY13, uh, it will also include our existing IT capabilities and the dollars that we spend. These processes are important in helping the Department accelerate the transition away from our legacy environment into our target business systems environment. Uh, but there are other activities underway within the Department to further support this goal. But first, I'd like to provide you some specific examples of what the Department has done. The Army reduced the number of IT applications from 218 to 77, a 65 percent reduction during their BRAC move from Fort Mammoth, New Jersey to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Uh, the Army acquisition domain has reduced the number of IT systems within that portfolio uh, by 41 percent from 2006. The Logistics Modernization Program has sunset all 42 instances of the Army's standard depot system. Additionally, they have sunset all but one instance of the Commodity Control Standard System, a system comprised of 460 applications. <clears throat> the Navy has reduced by 50 percent the number of applications across 21 functional areas since 2003. And since 2008, the Navy has eliminated over 400 legacy networks. The Marine Corps has reduced its applications by approximately 30 percent just over the last year and a half. The Air Force has taken an aggressive action as well and has reduced its IT budget request by $100 million in 2012. Air Force Material Command Headquarters has organized a Tiger team committed to finding software application duplication and outdated systems that can be terminated with acceptable risk. These efforts, coupled with our ongoing work to reform, reform acquisition of information capabilities and consolidating our infrastructure, are delivering better results for the business operations that our warfighters depend on. To continue our progress, an important part of moving forward is, is the infrastructure on which our business systems reside. We have developed an IT enterprise strategy and roadmap to optimize our DoD IT infrastructure. And we plan to continue reducing that infrastructure footprint, creating a joint enterprise, developing an enterprise identity management system, and reducing the number of data centers to drive our networks to enterprise solutions. With the roadmap, we are developing implementation plans to establish aggressive milestones to accomplish that goal. We are actively working with OMB on the data center consolidation. To date, we have made significant progress in that regard. Um, we are working with the military departments, DISA, and other components. In FY11, DOD closed over 50 data centers, and we plan to eliminate more than 125 data centers in FY12. Our focus on improving and designing an enterprise architecture and infrastructure will not only help DOD with migrating to enterprise solutions, but more importantly, it will provide the Department with an improved ability to secure our information networks and our information and data. These efforts are key to transforming how we operate, how we acquire, and how we manage our IT investment in order to ensure efficiency, effectiveness, and security while still providing capability. I welcome the support of this subcommittee and really look forward to working with you and other members of Congress as we strive to meet the challenges of streamlining and improving our overall IT capability. Thank you for your interest in our efforts and be glad to answer any questions as they come up. Thank you as well. Mr. Locatus. Good morning, Chairman Lankford, Ranking Member Connolly, and other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today on GAO's report on potentially duplicative IT investments. The Department of Energy appreciates the work being performed by the GAO to identify opportunities to improve mission effectiveness and fiscal efficiency. The DOE is dedicated to improving our overall IT portfolio management and to address areas identified in the GAO report. We are committed to ensuring DOE's IT investments make efficient use of taxpayer dollars at all times. As Chief Information Officer for the DOE, one of my roles is to enable science, energy, and nuclear security missions through technology that provides tangible positive outcomes. DOE is actively supporting and executing OMB's 25-point plan and other strategies championed by Vivek Kundra and now Stephen Van Rokel. The Federal CIO community greatly appreciates their leadership and commitment to service. DOE is also supporting GSA by taking advantage of their sourcing and contract vehicles whenever we can and providing input to make them more usable wherever possible. 
Upon my arrival 16 months ago, I conducted a 45-day assessment and identified many opportunities to improve effectiveness and efficiencies of our IT. Many of these opportunities stemmed from fragmentation and duplication. As a result, I partnered with our program offices and moved forward to change the way we do business. DOE has implemented an Information Govern uh, Management Governance Council that solidifies accountability in our senior officials and has already delivered tangible outcomes that have enabled us to maximize the return of our IT investments and reduce duplication. In the areas of duplication, let me highlight three examples for you. First is our Joint Cybersecurity Coordination Center, or JC3. There is nothing more important than our national security, and DOE needed to connect its cybersecurity resources more efficiently across the complex. We established the JC3 to take a collaborative approach to cyber information sharing and analysis and instant response across DOE enterprise and more effectively leverage the technical expertise of our national laboratories. This has made our cyber program stronger and consolidated a number of duplicative functions. The second is our new virtual desktop infrastructure, which consolidates applications deployed across thousands of desktop computers into a small number of servers that deliver productivity to virtually any end user device including thin clients, smartphones, and tablets. The virtual desktop infrastructure creates an environment that is energy efficiently, inherently more secure, and costs much less to maintain. The third is unified communications and desktop video conferencing. We are consolidating into a low-cost, common desktop video conferencing solution that better connects our employees. By enabling employees through instant messaging, web conferencing, and desktop video conferencing, we are targeting millions of dollars in travel savings and creating new efficiencies through enhanced collaboration and productivity, even where travel would not have been previously required. In conclusion, the GAO report has identified IT investment efficiency improvement opportunities for the DOE. I have just mentioned uh, other areas in which we are aggressively breaking down silos and enabling the mission through technology across the Department. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the report's findings. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Mr. Spires. Chairman Lankford, Ranking Member Connolly, thank you and good morning. Today I will discuss efforts at the Department of Homeland Security to reduce duplicates duplicative IT investments. The key for an agency to eliminate system duplication is to develop an environment at the senior executive level that, one, enables a group of executives representing all appropriate organizations to work collaboratively to understand agency needs in a particular mission or business area, two, completes a comprehensive analysis in the mission or business area to identify ways to improve both effectiveness and efficiency across the enterprise, and three, has a decision-making process in which those same executives can effectively drive change based on the analysis. I have found both in government and the private sector that if you can create these conditions, over time executives will be able to make the hard decisions on the trade-offs and compromises necessary for the good of the enterprise. I use the term strategic alignment to reflect what is necessary for success. In my experience, the best way to achieve such alignment is through strong enterprise and portfolio governance buttressed by segment enterprise architecture. Enterprise governance provides large organizations with the ability to effectively make informed decisions that involve stakeholders across the enterprise. In small organizations, it is possible to execute enterprise governance with one governance body that represents top leadership. But in larger and more complex organizations, we need to break the challenge down into what we call portfolios, or logical partitions, that can support various elements of an organization's mission and business outcomes. Portfolios should typically represent functional groupings that can drive improvements to mission and business effectiveness. At DHS, we are working to implement 13 function-oriented portfolios to include mission support functions such as screening and incident response, along with business functions such as finance. So how does this work? Each portfolio has a governance board of appropriate senior executives that look over a multi-year planning horizon and define a set of measurable stretch objectives that would significantly improve mission or business effectiveness. 
To achieve those objectives, the Portfolio Governance Board must establish capabilities that are required to meet such objectives. For instance, in a human resource portfolio, a capability may be to have an automated end-to-end -end tracking of all steps in a hiring process with the objective to reduce the average time to hire by 50 percent. Once the objectives and capabilities are set, the Board works with subject matter experts to define the business process changes, IT system changes, elimination of redundant systems, and other appropriate program changes to achieve a goal and state. Once that goal and state is defined, the Board sets a transition strategy that defines the step-by-step -step process to go from the current or as-is state to the goal or desired state. The approach outlined above applies the generally accepted federal segment enterprise architecture methodology to a portfolio. At DHS, we are working to implement portfolios to drive improved mission effectiveness while eliminating duplication. For instance, a comprehensive HR system inventory revealed 124 systems, including many duplicative systems. We established an HRIT portfolio governance board and recently completed our human capital segment architecture, which will effectively shift a large number of these component-based systems and services to enterprise or Federal Government solutions. Likewise, we identified more than 20 separate common operating picture systems supporting the situational awareness needs of the Homeland Security mission. Leveraging a portfolio approach, this month our National Operations Center will stand up an upgraded version of the DHS common operating picture that incorporates all components requirements. The plan is then to roll out the new common operating picture to DHS operations centers across the enterprise over the next year, eliminating numerous duplicative common operating picture investments. It takes about three years of hard work for a portfolio governance approach to mature to the point where the portfolio has a solid set of business objectives and measures, a defined goal and state, and a viable enterprise transition strategy. Despite the difficulties, the benefit of this work can be tremendous. These methods can and should support implementation of the Shared First initiative aimed at rooting out waste and duplication across the Federal IT portfolio. Thank you and look forward to taking your questions. I thank all of our witnesses for testifying today. And um, let me um, recognize myself for five minutes and let's have some, some conversation on this as well. I have a, a couple of thoughts on it. One is, um, Mr. Pounder, you, you mentioned the dashboard on it at this point. And what I would like to know for all of you that have integrated with that as well, has that been helpful and what is missing from that? Is there a next level for that use in the da dashboard and is it a helpful tool? So anyone can jump in and be able to respond to that. Well, let me start. and um, I am sure my colleagues have the same uh, view. We found the dashboard process to be very, very helpful. Um, it does really, the, I think it really in many ways takes the OMB desire for transparency and really gives us the opportunity to be able to um, be able to put priority on that dashboard process. So it does give the kind of transparency that we all need, but it also gives it at a higher level, which I think is helpful. Um, in terms of going forward, I think our major challenge is to make sure that we are taking the best advantage of that dashboard process internally um, to make sure that we are driving the kind of process change that is needed. Not, not every agency is engaged in that. Is that correct, Mr. Pounder? That, that's what I'm yeah, that's, I, I think uh, a couple things. I think the improved transparency is very important from an oversight perspective, whether you are at OMB or if you are at agency or if you are in, in the Congress. The one thing that the dashboard did is I think it greatly increased CIO accountability. Uh, what it says is for all major investments, there's 800 of them across the major departments, is the CIO is ultimately accountable. So Ms. Takai has her pictures next to her 72 major investments. That actually was a good thing for some agencies where we needed more CIO accountability. Okay. It was very, very helpful moving forward. The, the issue is, uh, is, it, uh, is the number right? Uh, are there other projects that need to be there? Obviously not every agency has that large of an investment. Mr. Kai has very complicated, large, numerous projects on it. Uh, should that work its way down to other agencies and say, okay, this is large for your agency instead well, of setting a single standard for every agency? 
Well, there are 7,200 uh, investments, so there's 800 major and the rest are non-major. I think over time, as the dashboard matures, it would be helpful to get insights into those non-majors. But again, we probably ought to do that in a stepwise fashion sure. to get the, the majors but The, the, the question is, what, what is major to the Federal Government or what is major to your agency? And there, there's a difference there. You can look at each agency and say, you know, I know you don't reach this level, but give us your five largest most significant projects that are on there, whatever it may be, whatever dollar amount that is, and those are your majors on there. Right. No, that is an excellent point. It does differ. In, in fact, several non-majors at DOD would clearly be majors at other agencies. Right. Mr. Cobb, you are going to mention them as well. I would like <coughs> to add to um, Mr. Pounder's comments that uh, the, the visibility and transparency is important, not only for us as CIOs, but actually what we would view as more important is the visibility to the business process owners and the business process changes that really have to happen for any IT implementation to be successful. Um, the success of these large-scale business systems are really more around can we change the processes and can we actually make the business changes that we need than necessarily just being uh, dictated by the dynamics of the technology implementation. And the dashboard really brings the opportunity for us to have the dialogue at a much um, at a much different level than if it were just delegated to be a te being a technology discussion. Okay. Well, we may have some other time for other questions as we go from here. Let me, let me address one thing with DHS on it, because I have a lot of very positive things and just ideas we can get a chance to kick around. Uh, DHS had the Secure Border Initiative Network. I know that is a long term. That is not your favorite project to talk about, because it was this long term project uh, that ended up spending a billion dollars, then getting folded down and saying this didn't work uh, on it. That, that is something every agency deals with to experiment, to try. Technology is always going to be out on the leading edge uh, of saying, how can we accomplish that? The issue is, uh, how, how can you, uh, how do we integrate? Uh, well, let, let, me, let me phrase it a couple of ways. One is it is integrating off the shelf technology, commodity IT stuff, it, it, when it is appropriate. And the second one is, how do we anticipate through our process of going through contracting to try to find areas saying this is outside of our expertise? And so we don't end up with a dead end and a billion dollar debt, and we don't have anything at the end. So two separate projects: integrating the commodity IT stuff where appropriate, and the second one is how do we head off a dead end before we get there? Um, it's a great example, sir, um, to bring up SBI Net. Um, there were a lot of things that DHS did wrong early on that program. Um, I would like to say in in, in the follow on and what we're doing because the. The, uh, the concept of fixed towers with the, the kinds of surveillance equipment on those towers to monitor the southwest border is still a concept that the Border Patrol within CBP really wants. And so uh, we're, we're actually moving forward with a new program, but we're using, as you say, commodity, there's not IT, but commodity technologies. And in fact, uh, we're about ready to go out with a request for proposal to the industry based on market research we've done. Okay, in order to procure what we are calling non-developmental solutions, meaning solutions that already exist somewhere in the world to be able to do this kind of surveillance work. Um, I think that is where the government really needs to look. How is it that we can leverage things that already exist within industry or within other governments or within other agencies rather than, to your point, rather than going out and trying to build things custom? And I believe this is a good example, and I have worked closely with Mr. Mark Borkowski on this, who is the program manager of that new initiative. And we are both aligned that says if we, can not, if we go out with that RFP and we get something that is, that is uh, developmental in nature in any way, we are just not going to award. Okay, we are only going to award if it is truly non-developmental, that it exists somewhere, and that you can just field this thing. All right? And that, I think, is more what we need to do as a government. And we need to have the discipline, though, to make sure that we have the requirements approach. When we work with the business owners, we have got to work with them in such a way, and this is part of good governance, so that they understand it is much better for them to perhaps give a bit on their requirements, okay, get 80 percent of the solution that is off the shelf, rather than requiring us to try to build that additional 20 percent custom. If you start with the 80 percent solution that is off the shelf, and then work with the vendor community for existing products over time for them to upgrade their products to address more and more of our requirements, that is a much less, uh, a much, uh, less costly and it is a, a much less risky approach to delivering IT. Okay. Thank Hopefully I have gotten to this. No, that's, 
That, that's great. That, that's getting to it. We're working on solutions on that. Let me recognize Mr. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and immediately after this round of questioning, I'm going to have to leave to go to the floor. Um, we're going to be voting shortly. We're going to, we have one hour of debate, and then we're going to vote. Um, welcome all uh, to the panel. And, Mr. Chairman, um, let me respectfully invite you again to consider uh, uh, H.R. 1713, the Federal Cost Reduction Act I introduced uh, a number of months ago, uh, to try to codify what Vivek Kundra started in terms of the data center uh, consolidation and to, in, and to ensure uh, taxpayer savings with that consolidation. And uh, I would love to have your co-sponsorship, but certainly I think it might be timely after this hearing uh, to hold a hearing on that, um, if, if you would. Um, and I want, again, I want to thank you all for being here. Mr. Uh, Mr. Ponner, uh, how do you feel the data center consolidation, the closure uh, and, and consolidation is going? And uh, what is your estimate of, in a sense, the utility savings? Because I gather that is the lion's share of the savings from these uh, consolidations, uh, what we might expect to achieve with, with it. Well, we have had a good start on data center consolidation, and I know uh, Mr. Spires chairs a, a committee uh, government-wide that looks at this. A couple key things that our work has shown, and we have done uh, several reviews of the data center inventories and plans. One, we need to ensure that we are capturing all the inventory out there and then have solid plans for consolidation. And the numbers are fine, Ranking Member Connolly, where we have X number of centers that we close today, so that is good progress, and we have a good goal of 1,000 centers by 2015. But ultimately, it is about saving money. So we really need to look at those plans in terms of when can we start seeing the dollar savings through those consolidation efforts. And that is something that we are currently reviewing for the Congress when we are uh, looking at those detailed uh, consolidation plans. So good start, but we still need to see the ultimate measure is a reduction in costs associated with these centers and more efficiencies going forward. Right. Uh, because the efficiency and the cost savings are sort of the name of the game. That is right. Um, do you believe we can build on that? When we had, the last time we had Vivek Country here, which was a swan song uh, before this committee, um, he, uh, he actually expressed some enthusiasm for this bill I referred to and actually agreed that we could do more as we move out to the future. Your sense of that? Uh, clearly, we need to do more. I think the IT reform plan, which data center consolidation is front and center, there were very clear deliverables 6, 12, and 18 months. But if you look at the data center consolidation initiative, that is a long-term initiative. That will go beyond 18 months, and we need to keep the momentum beyond 18 months. I commend the administration for the stretch goals on the 6, 12, and 18 months, but we need to have a plan that would go beyond 18 to truly achieve those cost efficiencies. Yeah, which I think means more ambitious numbers in terms of consolidation than even originally envisioned in the 25-point plan. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I actually think if we would hit that 1,000 center reduction mark, we would see some great efficiencies with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, let me start with you, too, but invite your colleagues to comment. Um, uh, cloud computing, it is estimated that, uh, well, it is an inevitable part of the Federal future. The question is uh, how much, how fast, and how secure. Uh, and there are also some liability legal questions, depending on where the cloud is located, what company is registered in what country, uh, how our data and how other laws affect us. But as assuming all of that, uh, what, what is your sense of uh, where we are headed in cloud computing um, for our Federal agencies? And, and what concerns might you have from a legislative point of view, cybersecurity, for example, uh, that uh, ought to be on our plate? So a couple things with cloud computing. Similar to data center consolidation, I mean, there are efforts. The IT reform plan calls for the major departments and agencies to consolidate three services to the cloud. Uh, that is a good start. Again, we want to consolidate those services. I think uh, Mr. Locatus has a number of initiatives looking at commodity IT where he is looking at this. Ultimately, it is about cost savings when it is all said and done. It is not about three 
from a security perspective, a couple key things. Um, if there are great security concerns, you can start with private clouds over public clouds. I know Mr. Spires has a number of initiatives where he's focused more on the private clouds where you can put your security requirements in. Some of the initiatives at GSA with FedRAMP, that will clearly help. I do think security needs to be front and center when we move to the cloud, but be between FedRAMP and some of those initiatives or considering the private clouds, you can address those security concerns and still move to the cloud. Mr. Lukaitis? Uh, yes. Uh, we Could you speak up? Oh, absolutely. We see this now as uh, an opportunity for the data center consolidation uh, effort to intersect uh, the cloud offerings that are being offered by the private sector, private cloud offerings that can be FISMA certified. And so in our first round of data center consolidation, we have closed three data centers. We will have another two data centers. We don't have the, the size that the Department of Defense has, but we are aggressively approaching that. Um, and we have saved approximately $7 million through those data center closures. But now in our next round of planning, this is where we are looking at infrastructure as a service and working with the private sector uh, through the security issues that you discussed to break through, working very closely with GSA on their sourcing capabilities, contracts, procurements. Uh, the FedRAMP uh, and FISMA processes. Uh, I might add, sir, that uh, we at DHS are taking a very aggressive approach to the cloud. As Mr. Pounder uh, noted, we have a private cloud capability within our two enterprise data centers, which is our target for all of our consolidation initiatives. So that ties to what Mr. Locatus said as well, the nexus between data center consolidation and leveraging cloud services, particularly for commodity IT. We are rolling out nine different cloud offerings in our private cloud, including such things as email as a service, uh, development and test as a service, infrastructure as a service, very aggressive. On the public cloud side, we are going more slowly because of the security concerns at this point. We are moving our public-facing websites to the public cloud, however, because it is non-sensitive data. And then we are going to assess, as FedRAMP matures and we see that the cloud service providers, public cloud service providers, begin to meet FISMA low and moderate capabilities, I think you are going to see a much more aggressive approach by ourselves and by other agencies over the next two to three years. I am actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I know I am over my time, but I am I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, my own feeling is that actually, though it may seem counterintuitive to us in the public sector, uh, frankly, security may be better in the private sector uh, because they live or die on their reputation and on their protection of data and on taking care of clients. Um, and sometimes in the public sector, you know, we may have a bad moment in terms of a compromise, a cybersecurity compromise. Uh, the consequences are, you know, uh, uh, perhaps it hurt, affects your promotion. But I mean, it's you know, whereas in the private sector, literally, you can go out of business if you. If you screw up, and so I, I think uh, uh, I think there may be some advantages in the private sector, and I'm very I think the approach you've outlined makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate the ranking members' questions uh, on that area, and, and you giving latitude to continue that process because that was a that was a concern that I wanted to uh, hear about as well, and appreciate uh, Mr. Spires' your response uh, specifically as we look at uh, security issues. Um, across the spectrum. Um, let me uh, ask uh, Mr. Spires um, uh, specifically what distinguishes, you know, we have seen that you have um, uh, the best record of not having redundancies and uh, um, you have done a, a good effort there. What distinguishes DHS from the other agencies in terms of its identification and elimination of overlapping or duplicative IT investments? Um, sir, I go back to uh, the testimony. We, we, I've put a tremendous effort on setting up what we call these functional portfolios. And so, as you, I'm sure you're well aware, within DHS, we have 22 separate components. Um, some very large, like the Coast Guard and CBP, and some, some relatively small, like our, our health affairs organization. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of the functions of DHS cross-cut those components. And what I've tried to really do as a CIO is make sure that we look 
functionally at DHS, not just vertically from the organizational standpoint, because it, it, when you look functionally, whether we are doing screening or incident response um, on the, if you will, on the mission side, or whether we are doing the business functions like finance and HR, um, you see tremendous amount of duplication when you look at it from that functional perspective. So I'm just a big believer if you can bring the executives, the right executives together in a functional area and get a dialogue going or a structured dialogue over time, you, they see the commonality, okay? They start to recognize it. They start to see the advantages of working together rather than continuing in their stovepipe. That gets them beyond the turf mentality? Well, I mean, it's, this is not easy. I mean, this, as I said, it takes three years or so, in my experience, both in the private sector at IRS and now at DHS, to get this to really work well. But it does work. And, and we have seen tremendous uh, improvements. We are right now, in fact, screening is a great example, passenger screening or people screening. Um, you know, we have got you know, six different components doing this screening, okay? And we have got systems in each of these components, all right, that are essentially duplicative. And now, even at the, the, the deputy secretary is taking this on. We're working together. We've got the right kind of governance model set up, this portfolio around screening, to really look at where can we consolidate, where can we standardize in order to eliminate this kind of duplication. It's a very different way of looking at an agency's functions. And I think in any federated kind of agency, and certainly my colleagues here are also at federated agencies, this kind of process can work to help eliminate duplication. Well, I applaud that, and uh, <laughs> may it continue and expand. And I would, I would then move to uh, Ms. Takai and, and Mr. Okadis. Uh, on, the, on the reverse side, with much duplication uh, or concerns of duplication in your agencies, um, what are the causes that you have you've come to uh, ascertain at this point in time for the duplication? Well, we, uh, as Richard said, he has got three years, so we have really studied uh, the Department of Homeland Security governance model and, in fact, implemented many of the same uh, work groups and governance capabilities, including our Information Management Governance Council, which has accountability at the undersecretary level of our three primary programs. The other thing we have done is looked at it from an interagency sharing perspective. Where can we leverage capabilities in other agencies and not duplicate uh, or reinvent the wheel? And it's not just in the technology areas, it's in the investment in people, process, and technology for running operations. So one of those examples is the Department of Energy did not create its own payroll system. It leverages the defense, finance, and accounting services capability and buys those services directly from DOD versus creating our own capabilities. So another important piece of this is working across the departments to leverage shared services and not make the investment at all, but simply subscribe to it where you have a center of excellence like DFAS within DOD. Mr. Kai, again, what, what causes for duplication have, have you addressed? Well, historically at DOD, um, our information technology spend was very decentralized. Um, and very focused on mission capability in our services and then clearly what was necessary in our forward deployed areas. And the business systems were also distributed from the standpoint of the funding and the decision making process. So in, in answer to your question in terms of where did what happened in the past to get us to this point, um, I think that that particular model uh, really caused a, a, a sense of uniqueness in different organizations and then the funding to actually look at that. Um, I think to the point that um, you know, both um, Mr. Lakaitis and, and Mr. Spires have made, those are the things that we are working to really change. Um, you know, we recognize that spending in a decentralized fashion, not taking a view of what our overall portfolio management should be has led to the duplication that we have today. Um, but our larger challenge is actually getting past the process piece, which says that um, we don't need to have specific um, systems that do personnel processing differently because each of the services actually does do personnel processing a little bit differently. And so our challenge is to really be able to address those process issues as well. 
Um, the other challenge that we have is always the demand from we need to have capability at the tactical edge. Um, and I think back to the question, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you asked about, that really then gets us into not only looking at the business systems piece of it, but some of the forward technologies that you talked about and our ability to really look at different processes in order to be able to introduce commercial technology as well as uh, the challenges there. Um, the last item I would point to is that um, to the discussion on our ability to move forward on some of these areas in, in our, the way that we are addressing the cloud strategies. Um, it, it is a challenge for us particularly across all of our networks, um, classified, uh, secret and top secret, to really understand um, the way forward in terms of working with our commercial partners from a security perspective. Um, the ramifications for us from a national security perspective in making sure that our data are secure are significant. And so we are moving forward in that direction. Um, we are looking to take advantage of the same things that DHS is from the standpoint of FISMA and then the recent FedRAMP process. Um, but we are walking through that methodically uh, because we do have to be very concerned about the protection of our information, uh, you know, as a national asset. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Meehan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Because you're the folks that understand these systems or purportedly do. And any institution I have ever been associated with always comes down to somebody saying, who understands how to get information out of this and move it? move it efficiently, and I appreciate the, the challenge that you have uh, as well. I know it is easy to pontificate up here, but I often struggled when I would have authority in the Department of Justice or otherwise over numerous agencies. There, there seemed to be a lot of discussion about systems, but it often went back to situations in which individuals had their own little turf to protect. And I don't know how we get beyond turf protection and get to the real issue of, of evaluating what's working. Now, I just, uh, Mr. Spires, I, I, I particularly appreciate the work that, that you and your folks are doing. I just sat through in my capacity with uh, over, not an oversight, but in my capacity on Homeland Security. We had the occasion to listen to testimony from the director. We were looking at budget issues. I know there's a lot of good efforts that are being made to, to, to create efficiencies at DHS. Um, I also have the fortune of ha visiting within my district numerous businesses from time to time, and I am very pleased to have uh, an industry leader, SAP, in my district. And we were talking. I, I asked them, you know, what are you really doing? And one of the things we spent some time talking about was some of the systems they have been using effectively. Uh, in DHS, for partic in, in, in particular, I think they're working for the Customs and Border Patrol. They were very proud to have had the one group that had a clean audit based on going back and using that. Now I'm also discussing, but 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 now FEMA is coming out and looking at a system. If 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 one system is working, why why are we looking at a new approach to to to, to try and to have FEMA? Why aren't we just taking what's working at CBP and using it with FEMA? Uh, sir, that that's a very good question. Um, we are in a situation of evaluating for FEMA right now. What's the best way forward uh, for them for financial management? Uh, the, I believe the system you refer to at Customs and Border Patrol is their financial system. That is is an SAP yeah. system. Yeah. Um, we we um, because of the contractual relationships that we have, we cannot take, for instance, the the system we have at CBP and leverage it for enterprise use. That's a contractual issue the way it was set up. So, so we you mean we're dealing with a legacy issue, so to speak? It's a legacy, yes. The way these contracts were originally set up, we just cannot do that. We are there, are wanted there, to do that, and we have not been able to. Is it, you know, in, in industries, there are liquidated damages for non-performance. Is there any kind of circumstance under which uh, if, if, if you are looking at a better system, do people go back and look at systems that aren't working and 
therefore have the ability to break through previous contract provisions for, for, for non-performance? Well, I don't think in this case it's an issue of non-performance, okay? Um, FEMA is looking to upgrade its system. It's on a, a legacy system that is frankly outdated, does not provide all the functionality they need. Uh, we, would, we are assessing our options. Um, as you probably are aware, we've gone through a number of procurements that even predate my tenure um, on trying to look at an enterprise capability for financial management across DHS, and we've just never been able to even get to an award uh, because of protests and, and some legal issues that we ran into. I hate to, I hate to say that, but that is the truth. Well, I'd be interested to hear what we can do to help you in that regard, because, Mr. Kai, I would be interested in your observation. Again, so it's, it's incredible how we get little bits of information from time to time and you seize on things, but because of my work on this committee, I'm aware of the, you know, the Air Force circ circumstances right now with the, with the effort. Um, my, my recollection was I asked my staff to look into it, and they did give me a little information about the expeditionary combat support system. And we're talking about a system now that, uh, to my information, is uh, you're, you're billions of dollars into it. They're coming back to us for $90 million more. Why aren't we looking across the board to see there's other things working right here in other parts of the Department of Defense? And, and, and how is it that we continue to be locked into these, you know, into these silos? Uh, is it because they're protecting their interests with the lawyers? Well, um, let me address the, um, the logistics question that you're asking, the, the question around logistics systems, and then come back to the broader question. Um, first of all, the um, ECSS system is it's, you know, they have to have an acronym or you, you can't be from DOD, um, is one of the logistics systems that's under a review of a set of eight logistics systems in the department. And the um, Acquisition Technology and Logistics Organization is actually doing a review right now um, to look at across that portfolio to say where is there duplication and where can we uh, actually look at a different way and a better way of doing it. Um, I think, secondly, there are two answers to your question of how does this happen. Um, one of them is that, in some cases, again, we do have unique requirements. So, for instance, in our operation, what Air Force has to do from a, a material logistics process is not necessarily the same in terms of doing maintenance in our um, train and, man train and equip organizations isn't exactly the same as what a transcom operation has to do in terms of being able to make sure that there are supply lines to our forward deployed trips. So I do think there's some terminology that are differences, uh, and there are legitimate differences. But there's also the situation, I think, to the point that you're making, where there are processes embedded in terms of the way that we do things. Um, it may not necessarily be a single individual, but it certainly is a single organization. Um, and the question that has to be weighed is, what is the uh, ability of a large organization to make a change, even in some fairly what we would consider straightforward business processes, um, in order to be able to implement standard technology versus keeping the processes that we have today um, and actually being able to use a more standard solution? It is a challenge. Um, you know, I was, um, both uh, Mr. Lakaitis and I were in state government in several states. Um, we saw it from a state government perspective just in terms of being able to draw departments and agencies together, um, same kind of experience in the private sector. And it really is around that ability to change from the way we are used to doing things today, the way we know works, to something that is even a little different that may yield the same result but makes organizations uneasy in terms of their ability to make that change. Well, I know. I, I probably share the sentiments of my colleagues on this committee. If you have suggestions about things that you think would make your job easier to do to get to these efficiencies, I'm sure that we would entertain those suggestions and include them in our own deliberations. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. We are going to do a quick second round of some questions on it. Uh, as you have probably guessed, uh, the votes have moved around again. Uh, they will be closer to 1045 now. That gives a little more buffer time to be able to pummel you with a few more questions and uh, try to get some of this information in on the record on as well. Uh, I want to follow up on a comment that Mr. Spires made about we would like to take a system from over here 
and use it over here, but the contract doesn't allow it. It, it leads me into a couple issues that I have on keeping contracting officers engaged in what technology is needed. Now, they, they cannot be specialists in every single area that they are dealing with all their, their different contracts on. What, what are you doing to keep those contracting officers engaged on a couple of things? One is to say, watching for when it comes down, who has the expertise in this area? Is it actually accurate for what we are looking for so we are not having to get a system and then redo the system and go, no, that doesn't work, and let's redo it again, right. and how to get through all that process, and then to be able to protect in the future in our contracts that if we are using it over here, we can also use it over here. Now, I understand these private vendors want to sell it in 15 different places. I, I get that. Uh, but within an agency especially, there has to be some level of flexibility, even if it is to say, if we use it here and we use it over here, we pay you another fee, but it is a smaller fee than it is over here, but we are not blocked out and have to start all over again when it is a very simple difference. Um, you talked before about supply chains and financial management and managing human capital. Th those are fairly consistent with minor adaptations on them. So how do we start developing contracts so that we can actually not reinvent the wheel time after time with the exact same vendor over and over again? Uh, within DHS, uh, I partner very closely with um, our chief procurement officer, who is a peer of mine, um, Mr. Nick Nyack. And the two things that he's really taking on to address your very points. Uh, one, he's created a special cadre of contracting officers who do nothing but work closely with us and specialize on IT. Okay, so that doesn't make them uh, technology specialists in IT. But over time, they start to understand the complexities of helping us buy IT, right, and work closely with our programs. And I think that's a best practice that a number of other agencies are adopting as well. Um, so that's not a fix, an immediate fix, but over time, it does make a big difference. And the, the individual that heads that organization works with us every day, okay, very, very closely. Um, I would say to your other point, we, we are also working on standard contract language now that covers exactly what you, you suggested. I'm amazed. I walk in here and there's a number of these issues where I say we'd love to leverage this capability we have in one component in DHS and another, and we can't because the contract does not allow us. And, and so we're forced back into these you know, having to go out and full on open competition when if it was set up right in the first place, we could do exactly what you suggested. So we're putting standard contract language in. When we go out with these procurements, it can be least leveraged DHS-wide. And in fact, we're working in the Federal CIO Council um, with OMB. Can we come up with standard language that allows us to even issue contracts that could be leveraged by other agencies as right. well? So we are taking that, that issue on. Sir. Yeah, long term, that is obviously what is going to help us the most. Mm -hmm. I mean, if companies are competing, they are going to give us a much lower bid at the beginning, thinking if I can get this and do it well, mm -hmm. and I can also multiply it out if I can get this to five other agencies and it would be cheaper on all those and beat all those contracts as well. It is to their benefit. It is to the Federal Government's benefit because we will get cheaper contracts uh, all the way th across the board as it is duplicated out. My, my concern is, and, and this is just interaction with some different guys that do programming and do some of the writing. Everyone who does that, especially for their own agency that is tapped for it, seems to have their perspective. They didn't do it as well as we would do it. And so we are not going to take their stuff. We are going to start all over and do our stuff. Uh, now, I am not, not saying that is an arrogance. Quite frankly, they are tenacious about security. They are tenacious about the coding and to make sure everything is correct on that, which is great. We need those gifts. But it also seems to, to lock people into it needs to be done by me because I know us better than other things. When it is supply chain, it is fairly consistent uh, when you go in the hole. I, I would just comment, Ms. Takai really hit upon this issue of this idea of uniqueness, right, and how unique are my requirements. And it, I think we really need, um, through the CIO community and through um, the leadership of agencies, and this is where it gets difficult, to your point, particularly on these standard capabilities and what, what I consider back office, finance and HR and other, these are very similar, right? And if we can get to the 80 or 90 percent solution, we can get to the kind of, of, of environment you want where we are leveraging each other's capabilities. We are not having to build new. And I, I think we really need to take that on as a government. Okay. Thank you. Let me yield to Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. My apologies for stepping in a, a few minutes late. If this is, uh, I hope it's not uh, redundant. But that's uh, that's uh, sort of the theme of uh, what we're talking about today. So I won't feel too too bad about it. Um, 
Uh, I want to start with um, the Department of Defense. A uh, question about the Defense Finance Accounting System, or DFAS. Is there any progress being made with that? I mean, my, my understanding is this a facility in Indiana, a lot of good people working there, a lot of good stuff, but it's still so manual, um, it really hasn't come into the 21st century. Can you give me an update on what's happening there? Um, one of the challenges for us is to continue to move DFAS forward, and um, we are making significant progress in terms of um, both the utilization of the system and the system itself. Um, it is going to be very critically important to us as we move forward um, on our audit readiness requirements. And so it is a major part of the finance portfolio that the um, Department of uh, the Chief of Management Information Officer is looking at. And we don't have time here, but I would appreciate if somebody in the staff somewhere could update me on where it's at and where it's going and what the time frame looks like. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to actually coming and visiting that that facility uh, at, at some point. I also want to ask the uh, Department of Defense again. We've been looking in my subcommittee within oversight at the duplication and the problems and challenges between the different um, uh, agencies within uh, or departments within uh, DOD on the health care and the sharing of that information um, so that when somebody is actually, um, uh, you know, somebody has been serving in the military and they are going back into the private life, getting those records back to their doctor sometimes will take in excess of a year. And I just don't understand why it is so complicated and why it has been so tremendously expensive. Well, on that particular front, um, I think you are aware that we have made uh, considerable progress in terms of looking at the way forward. In fact, um, there is an initiative now which has been uh, signed out and actually has the, the visibility of both the Secretary of the Veterans Administration as well as Secretary of Defense. Um, and they have a joint project now to look at a combined electronic health records. What, what I can't get is a commitment as to the timing as to when this is actually going to get completed. Do you have any idea when this is going to get completed? Well, we can certainly come back. I know the group is today working on putting all of their plans together. So if you would um, let us, we'll come back to you with the detail on DFAS and then also with the project plan for the electronic health records. Uh, I would certainly appreciate it because it is such a major problem. I had an opportunity to, to talk to then Secretary Gates about this issue and the, the concern of the timing. And uh, uh, I was shocked. At, uh, a, I was pleased that he, he knew that what the timing issue was. But to try to cut it to the timeline that he had talked about, which would still be over a year to get these records into the hands, it is just unacceptable to me. And um, I do want to continue to, to follow up. Um, going now to the Department of Energy, th there is evidently, I had an uh, organization, a group, uh, Energy Enterprise Solutions, and I don't ex suspect that you know about every contract. Uh, Mr. Lokaitis, is that how you press? Lokaitis. Lokaitis, my, my apologies. Um, they had had a, a performance-based contract, and there's there's some sort of dispute there. I was just hoping that you could give us some assurance that you would look at that personally. I, I, if you're willing to make that commitment, I would appreciate it if you'd look at that contract and and, and get personally involved in that. If you be so kind, I'm reviewing it now. Okay, thank you. I I, I do appreciate doing that. Uh, last thing, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to ask about, and and stop me or let me know if this has been uh, uh, talked about. OMB um, is having some challenges because there are different coding mechanisms for accounting. And when I talk to the outside interest groups, the you know people that want good, open, transparent government, it's very difficult to compare the individual data because they use different coding within different departments, certain number of digits. Where on the radar screen between the four of y'all is this? And I'm sorry I didn't do a good job of articulating it, but um, where is this? on your radar screens? Well, let me start. Certainly, um, as it relates to being able to report and work with OMB on the IT budget line items, um, we have been working very closely with them uh, because it is an issue in terms of our internal reporting and working with OMB. Um, and certainly, that is a, you know, a major part. I think the second piece is, um, for us within DOD, um, we are concerned about just the overall coding and reporting um, for our effort around uh, being audit ready. 
So those are two efforts, certainly, for us inside DOD and working with OMB that um, have escalated the, the importance. Mr. Chair, my, my time has expired, and I, I will do a better job of articulating or perhaps putting in a letter that I would love to share with you all about the concern from OMB. Uh, particularly, again, this is the genesis coming from uh, outside groups that want to be able to compare apples to apples on line items amongst the various departments here, obviously represents some of the largest departments in our Federal Government. So. Uh, I'd like to follow up with that on you as well. But appreciate your, your commitment and your service. It's a very difficult and fast-paced uh, uh, sector, but vital to uh, good government and to making sure that they, they operate. And uh, so I appreciate you holding this hearing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kai, one last question on it as well. You, you brought up the, the famous audit word on, on DOD. Where are things on that? Uh, give us a, a timeline and progress on when we'll be auditable and, and tracking. Uh, the Secretary has tasked us to move up um, the prior plan, which was to be ready by 2017, to be ready by the beginning of 2015. Okay. Uh, and so the organization has um, put in place a number of different activities and a number, number of different measurements to get there. Okay. Uh, so we are all geared up and we are ready to go. Terrific. I appreciate that. And, and as I mentioned at the very beginning on the IT dashboard as well, I uh, appreciate all that you are doing there, but also keeping it up to date. Uh, there is one thing to report, and there is nothing to keep those reports up to date. And uh, that is always a, a wonderful, I am sure, extra thing on your desk. Uh, but to try to continue to push, there are some elements that uh, have been out there that have some lower scores, but they are not being kept up to date. And so we don't know how to be able to track that. And so that is important to be able to keep that up as well. I appreciate the success stories that you are sharing. I hope that this also is uh, indicative of a forum. Uh, of sharing ideas across uh, our Federal agencies. Uh, I am confident that you all get together as well, that you are establishing your own tech, tech stat reviews within your own agencies and doing all those dynamics to try to identify some of these things. But as we identify this, please encourage your peers uh, on ways of being able to share good ideas and how we can resolve this, as I am confident that you are. Uh, but as you solve some of the issues, share the solutions. And uh, it's not uh, it's not bad to be able to brag when we're saving money and making things more efficient. So, with that, I adjourn this hearing, and we are concluded.